the things that was kind of interesting to me that a lot of you referenced was Monopoly. <laughs> and, you know, the whole purpose of that Monopoly game was to get you thinking about, one, opportunities that surface in your life that if you pass them up may not come back around again, and two, to kind of get an idea of eternal rewards. And I was thinking about, as I was reading through your journals, I saw the reflections, I was thinking about Esther. And you guys all know the story of, of Queen Esther, right? So she was put in a, in a very unique role, right? And she came upon a time in, with her people that she, she should either stand up and take the risk of standing up, or if she chose to be afraid and not take that risk, somebody else would be brought up. And, and I was reading just a, a passage of scripture that I thought was kind of interesting. And I'll start, um, if you want to look it up, Esther 4 says, when Mordecai learned all had been, that all had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. If you read on, then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the, the queen writhed in great anguish. She was kind of understanding that Mordecai was, was pained. Um, so Esther summoned Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. So Mordecai, if you know the story, Mordecai came in and he told her what was going on. He told her that there was a plan and that the plan would wipe out the Israeli people. And all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who's not summoned, he has but one law and that they be put to death. Unless the king holds out his scepter, so that he may live, and I have not been summoned to come to the king for those 30 days. So she knows the truth, and she knows that she has the opportunity to save her people, but she must go to the king to do that. But she also knows if she does that, if she chooses to do that, she risks her life, because you can't go before the king unless you're summoned, right? So she's in an interesting spot. So what happens? Um, they related Esther's words to Mordecai, and he says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And I was thinking about that opportunity as you guys were playing Monopoly. There were opportunities that came for ministry, for service, right? You could choose to do that and receive the reward, or you could choose to play the game of life. You could choose to not take that opportunity. And I, I had three thoughts. One, faith always carries an element of risk. Your life, many of you are gonna be choosing what it is you're gonna be doing here in a few short weeks or short months. Uh, maybe what you wanna do is a risk. Maybe the passion that God has put in your heart is a risk. But you know what? Faith always carries an element of risk. So I challenge you, if God is putting something on your heart, do it. If God has placed something, a mission on your heart, do it. Number two, for her and for you, silence is not an option, right? If God is calling you to call out, silence is not an option. And number three, we must make a decision or, you know, are you in or are you out? You are called to certain tasks and you are called to make a decision. Are you in or are you out? I think it's kind of cool to think about this because a call of risk can only be God. In this case, a call of risk can only be God. And I, and I guess I would challenge you to think about, do you, have, do you have a vision that's worth dying for? That's huge. Do you personally have a vision for kingdom work that is worth dying for? Esther did, right? I hope you do too. I hope all of us have a calling that is so big, it's worth dying for. Okay, that just kind of came out of the journals. It was a thought that came, came up as I was reading through them, so... Um, 
A couple of things as we kind of get into the topic today. Chapter 8 in Faith and Money is dealing with a couple of real critical topics. Um, some of these topics we've talked a little bit about, such as God's ownership of everything, uh, and we looked at Deuteronomy 10:14. Remember I told you that's a good verse to have in your notes for God's ownership. To the Lord God belong the earth and everything in, a, in it, Deuteronomy 10, 14. And then second, that we've kind of talked a little bit about, the authors talk about how easy it is to have head knowledge that God owns it all, but it's harder to act on it. It's harder to actually enact on that, or act on that. Um, I, saw, I saw an interesting, this, this, I got this over email a while back, maybe you've seen it, and uh, I'll just kind of read it for you. It says, to my darling husband, before you return from your overseas trip, I just want to let you know about the small accident I had with the pickup truck when I turned into the driveway. Fortunately, not too bad, and I really didn't get hurt, so please don't worry too much about me. I was coming home from Walmart, and when I turned into the driveway, I accidentally pushed down on the accelerator instead of the brake. The garage door is slightly bent, but the pickup fortunately came to a halt when it bumped into your car. I'm really sorry, but I know with your kind-hearted personality, you will forgive me. You know how much I love you and care for you, my sweetheart. I cannot wait to hold you in my arms again, your loving wife. And there it is. <laughs> is that brutal? You see what kind of car that is? Yeah, anybody recognize this? Yeah, it's for a Ferrari. And it's Arkansas plates, which I don't know what that means. I wonder if he was forgiving. You think he was forgiving after that? I hope so. I hope he gave uh, ownership over to God. Uh, we have a true story. You never can tell what's on the internet. We do have a true story. We had a faculty member a couple of years ago that was uh, on his way to Biola to work. He was on his way to come teach. And when he was uh, on his way, he had stopped at a light and a semi had pulled up next to him. And the semi took the corner a little too quickly. And a car that he, he was driving a car that he had had for since he was like in junior high. And as it turned the corner, it rolled on him. This was his car. He was seated right here. This top of the semi literally folded his head down, just clearing the steering wheel. And he realized something that he loved, this blue 68 Mustang, that he'd had all of his life was not as important as his life. That's the whole picture. Is that amazing? This is when you realize that God's hand is on you. That picture is just amazing to me. I, and I was telling this story to a class, and I, um, I had a girl in the back kind of raise her hand. She said, I was in the car directly behind him, and the semi hit me as well, and did the exact same thing. She saw it coming, caught it out of the corner of her eye, and ducked just in time for the thing to lay down on top of her car, cr completely crushing her car too. This is when you know that God's hand is on you. You guys know I don't do a lot of PowerPoints, so. Is that amazing? So the question I wanted to ask you today, is when in your life have there been experiences like this where something you love that you just had to have, and we've talked a little bit about this before, that you finally got, and then something happens, and whatever that was doesn't have the same value that it did. I think it's something that we can kind of begin to think about and process as we're thinking through stuff. Um, I really appreciated the author's identification of five things that we can do to become more aware of God's ownership. It was on page 77. And you might want to write these down or make notes um, in the book on them. There are five things here that I actually encourage you to do. Um, for the next 30 days, meditate on 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. When you first awaken and just before going to sleep. Somebody look, at, look that up for me. I want you guys to read it. Look it up. Maybe even make a note in your Bible next to it. Maybe crimp the page. Put a little dog ear next to it. 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Somebody got that? Daniel's on it. Maybe. Somebody have it? Go for it. 
and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands and strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. I love that passage. How will your day change if you start every day for the next 30 days reading that passage and close your day at night reading that passage? And don't just read it, but kind of realize what it's talking about. It's a pretty powerful passage. So I challenge you to do that for the next 30 days. Make a little note in your Bible and just read 1 Chronicles 29, 11, and 12 when you first get up and when you go to sleep. Number two, and this one's huge. Be careful in the use of personal pronouns in your daily conversations, substituting yours or the Lord's for mine and ours. So when somebody says, can I borrow your computer? You can say, you may borrow God's computer. I thought they'll probably treat it a little better. Can I borrow your car? You may borrow God's car, right? How about that blue top? Can I borrow your blue top? Um, you may borrow God's top, <laughs> right? Do it, yeah. That point again, sorry, I was getting... Were you distracted? Yeah. No, the point is, be careful in the use of personal pronouns in your daily conversations, substituting yours or the Lord's for mine, my, and ours. So uh, it's just a realization in your life that God owns it all, right? That's what that whole idea is. And I think as you talk about it, as you do that, others will hear it and they're going to say, what? And you can open the door a little bit to talk a little bit about God's ownership of all we have. Number three, ask the Lord to make you aware of his ownership and make you willing to give up ownership. Okay, this one is absolutely huge. This one is like asking God for patience, right? What have, what have you heard about asking God for patience? What happens when you say, God, give me patience? You're tested, right? If you pray and ask God to make you aware of his ownership and make you willing to give up ownership, what do you expect will happen? I would expect you may be tested in that area. There may be something in your life that you will be asked to give, right? It's a scary thought. I challenge you to do it. Take it seriously. Ask the Lord to make you aware of His ownership and make you willing to give up ownership. We talked about this, right? And that could be anything. It could be anything. It could be your most prized possession, right? Does God ask us to give up everything? Well, if He knows that will grow our faith in the way He wants it to grow, he might. I don't know. Number four, pray for this new way of thinking during the next 30 days. Take seriously the whole concept of God's ownership for the next 30 days and see if you can expand that out in your life, that it becomes something that you do throughout your life. And then number five, establish the habit of acknowledging God's ownership or the Lord's ownership every time you purchase an item. That's another big deal. You know, if in fact we do that, when we go to the store to buy something, even if we've been saving up for it, and we realize that this is God's money, and this will be God's item, and is this something he really wants us to do when we shop? It may change totally how we live our lives. Um, the next section in the text is about God's control of every circumstance. We've been talking, there's been some pretty serious stuff that we've talked about in class the last few weeks. And this topic is serious. Um, have you ever had a circumstance in your life where you felt it was totally out of control? This is not rhetorical. Has there ever been a circumstance where you felt it was totally out of your control. Let me see your hands. You want to share it? What was it? Do you want to share it? Okay, you want to share yours? In high school, my sister was diagnosed with being bipolar. Hmm, that's huge. Yeah. Life changing. Yes. Yeah. How about you guys? 
Anything as a married couple yet that you've seen that was totally out of control? I think, I mean, obviously we, well, right before we got married, we had a lot of decisions to make. Yeah. And it was where are we going to live, how are we going to afford rent, because it's really expensive here, obviously. Yeah. And I didn't have a job at the time, so my grandparents were paying for everything, so it was like, how are we going to survive on this income? Yeah. So you're still kind of working that through, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? What circumstances come to mind where it was totally out of your, out of your control? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Transitioning from high school to being in like the higher market job. Yeah. Yeah. Th I think we've all had them. We've all had, to some extent, those times where you feel like it was totally out of control. I've had a couple of really significant ones. The first one, um, both of our daughters were born early and very, very small. Uh, Andrea, our oldest daughter, was an amazing delivery. Just, I mean, I, it was, I was the first time dad and I was just I was zoomed, you know, I was out of there. I, I couldn't believe how exciting this was. It's an amazing experience if you've ever been in for a birth. It, it's amazing. It's just stellar. It's probably the coolest thing that I've experienced. A and after Andrea was delivered, the nurses laid her down on mom, and then about Two or three minutes later, they took Andrea out. A and I didn't really think much about it. I was kind of, the, I, I don't know any difference, right? I'm just dad. Julie's an RN. She's a labor and delivery nurse. So she knew something was up with this. Well, Andrea was at risk because her breathing was not fully developed yet. So they needed to take her, make sure that she was healthy and okay. Well, the first, hi guys. The first week was touch and go. It was very, very difficult. We weren't sure how she was going to do. And ultimately, she did fine. But there was a period of time there where we weren't sure if she was going to make it, especially me. Julie always had, I mean, she had pretty good confidence. But I was in a panic. I was really in a panic before God going, that's my little girl. It's my new baby. You can't... Uh, come on, heal her, you know? There's that time where it was totally out of our control. By God's grace, she was fine. There was a second circumstance, however, that was really difficult for me. And I did this one by myself. Julie wasn't there. I got a call that my dad had had a, a brainstem stroke in Arizona. So I flew back to Arizona, met my family at the hospital. The doctors said, there is nothing we can do for a brainstem stroke. Absolutely nothing. All we, all we can do is, um, he's on life support now, that's what's keeping him alive. It's time when you're ready to pull the plug and let him go. <laughs> and I was, I was crushed. I love my dad, you know. And I, and I cried out to God. I said, this, this can't happen. This is my dad. This is my daddy. And um, so I, I said, I got to, I got to, Take a minute. And I, and I literally, this was Arizona in the summer, and I walked around the hospital. I'm just drenched in sweat, you know, just walking around, crying out to God, please save my dad. Please save my dad. And he was coming to us. There was nothing there. I mean, he just was gone. And I came back in, and as a family, we kind of gathered around dad, and I said, I just, I, I don't know what to do. And my sister, Sherry, looked, <laughs> looked at me, and she said, Let's ask Dad. <laughs> I said, Sherry's coma. <laughs> ask Dad. What, what, what are you gonna? What are you gonna ask him? She said, No, let's ask Dad. So um, we said to my dad, We said, Dad, you've had a brainstem stroke. They say that you are not going to recover and that we need to just let you go. If you want to fight this, um, tell us. And we saw this. <laughs> what was that? Dad, you've had a stroke, and if you want to fight this, r raise your finger again. And we saw this. And by that afternoon, he'd opened up an eye, <laughs> and he was looking around. He was recognizing us. And we had my dad for seven more years after that. Now, there were times in those seven years where I went, oh, his life is miserable, because he was never ambulatory. He could put 
maybe two or three sentences together, and he never fully recovered. He did have a sense of humor. You know, mom would lean over him and he'd pinch her and, you know, whatever. But it, it, was, it was amazing to have my dad for those seven years. And I do believe God answered my cry. I do believe that. Um, most amazing thing in my life to see that happen. Um, I think both of those are examples um, of what the author was talking about in this part of, of the material. Number one, God accomplishes his intention through times like that. And number two, God develops our character. I was not the same person after either one of those experiences as I was prior. I was changed in who I was, in my understanding of God, and how amazingly God can work. So why do you think God leads us through problems? Why does God lead us through problems? Um, I want you to break into your groups of four, and first I want you to share something that you have been through or you are going through. Everybody should have something that only God can answer, okay? Struggles that you have gone through or are going through that only God can answer. Go. I was in a, I was in a Sunday school class, this was a few years ago, in an adult Bible study fellowship with a very creative teacher. And one Sunday, he, um, he brought in a, a piece of brass. And it was, it was untempered. It was uh, just a raw piece of brass. And if you've, ever, if you've ever seen brass as a metal, it's a very, you know, pliable metal. And, and literally, he, he laid this piece of brass over the, over the side of the table. And he, and he just took his finger and he kind of went like this with it. And the brass went, you know, it's, there's, there's no strength to brass whatsoever. And um, he said, this is, you know, this is us before God's working of us. And we read this passage. And he started to talk a little bit about it. And while he talked, he took the brass and he brought in a little anvil and he brought in a hammer and he started to work the brass in this class, right? So he's talking to us and he's teaching us from Scripture about God's working in our lives. And he's hammering it away and he spent about five, six minutes working this piece of brass and just hammering on it and kind of pounding it out. And then he brought it back over to the same spot and he laid it out and he said, that's God working us. It's allowing difficult times to come, kind of pounding us, the potter working the clay concept. And he said, and this is what happens when God works on us. And he did the exact same thing. And it didn't bend. It, was a sp it had become a spring, right? Because it, it's the makeup of the, of the material had changed so much that it now was a spring, you know? It, it had changed what it was. And it's very similar to how we are changed through the working and the challenges and the testing that go on in our lives. So um, you, this, this is not a new passage for you guys. But look up James 1, 1 through 6. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials or temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Interesting passage, as you guys have processed some of the things that you're going through. Back into your groups, I want you to talk a little bit about testing 
and what that passage means through trials, okay? Examine what this passage is talking about and how those trials that you reflected on fit into this passage, okay? And then, after you've done that in a couple minutes, I'm going to have you pray for one another in case there was something of real significance that's coming up. I'd like you to support one another through prayer. Talk about the passage. Pray for one another. I'm going to close that out in just a couple minutes. Go. Money is perhaps the biggest area of trials in our life. It's actually really, really huge. And we can learn a lot through the challenges that we'll have through finances and money. Here are, here are a couple of quick reflections that you can take on problems and trials. And I, I would encourage you guys, isn't it cool that we're in a school that you can kind of lift up one another in prayer? I love that. Um, I encourage you to kind of continue to do that. As we talked the other day, it's, it's a great privilege to lift one another up. Um, here's some reflections we can take on problems and trials. Number one, um, Problems are inevitable. Problems are inevitable. It is, it's our response that can be different. Uh, 1 Peter 4.12, I love this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. What's that verse talking about? Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Fiery is pretty powerful. Anybody gone through fiery ordeals? I mean, that's pretty significant. Among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Huh. It's how we respond to them that tells a lot about who we are. And what we do in the trials, they're coming they're coming. If you can, you know, if any of you were struggling, I've never really been tested or tried. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, and there will come a day. Number two, problems are unpredictable. Problems are unpredictable. They usually come kind of when we least expect it, right? Ever hear somebody say um, things were just going too good or <laughs> more often you hear, I didn't see that coming, right? Because you never know what's coming. Problems are unpredictable. Problems are also variable. James 1, 2 talked about it. It said, we will encounter various trials, right? It's like they're custom made for us. God knows exactly what it's going to make to make us into the vessels that he wants us to be, right? He knows just what we need to refine us to his desires. And number four, Problems are purposeful. Problems are purposeful. There's a value to our problems. And I'll tell you, you want to learn from it the first time so you don't have to go through them again, right? I want to learn the first time I'm tested so that I don't have to try it again, that I have to run that course again. James 1, 3 through 4, testing of your faith produces endurance or patience. And endurance will have its perfect result of making us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's where I want to be. I, I want to be there, right? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So um, from this passage, we, what do we do when we face problems? Well, number one, when you guys face problems, and you will, rejoice. I know that sounds, really? But yeah, rejoice for we know that God is working in us. When I've had trials in my life, Oh, it's tough, it's bitter, it's hard. But I know that God is working in me in a way that he wants to refine me, right? Boy, that's tough to see when you're in the deep weeds. But it's true. Rejoice for we know that God is working in us. Number two, pray. James 1, 5 says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, right? If you're going through deep water right now, you don't know what to do. You don't know how you're going to get out of debt. You don't know what your job's going to look like. Pray. If you, if you lack wisdom, pray, right? And number three, relax and trust God for direction. If you're going through tough times, rejoice, pray, relax, and trust God for direction. I love this. This was a, uh, I think I've read some of Ryan's stuff before to you. 
A friend of mine writes um, kind of lessons that he sends out. He's, he's on the radio, and this is kind of one of the ministries that he has. And I really, really like this. Um, got two of his things here. Make sure I've got the right one. They Had No Bread is the title. And here, here's how it goes. Uh, he uses Mark 8.16, if you want to mark the scripture. And the scripture talks about, they began to discuss with, an, uh, with one another the fact that they had no bread. And here's what Mike says. He says, before we dig in, let me assure you this memo is not about bread. It's about the lack in your life. It's about the thing that is desperately needed that you cannot gather to yourself. It's about the thing which is just out of your reach and beyond your control. So now that we've set the table, let's eat. On two specific occasions, Jesus fed 5,000 and 4,000 with no more than a couple loaves of bread and a few fish. The disciples, having seen Christ feed thousands, are now in a boat with him. But in their hurry to get to the other side, they forgot to bring the bread. They had but one loaf of bread among them. So as Jesus was trying to impart to them a lesson about belief, the disciples were busy discussing the bread. I can only imagine Peter saying to John, no, it's your job to bring the bread. Mark is generous in his description saying that they were discussing the fact that they had no bread. Jesus was not so generous saying, do you not see or understand? Do you, not, do you have a hardened heart? Jesus had to go over the math with them one more time. We started with five loaves, and after everyone was fed, how much was left over? They responded, 12 baskets. We started with seven loaves, and how much was left over? They responded, seven baskets. Jesus concluded the lesson. Do you not understand? How about you? Do you not yet understand who your Father in heaven really is? Now what is your lack? What do you have need of? Stop discussing it with yourself. It won't change the facts. Do the math and get on your knees and take it to Jesus. Let him fill your need and see how much is left over when he is done. It's pretty powerful because I could see myself on the boat. It was your job to bring the bread and forgetting the resources that we have through the king. It's huge. Very, very powerful. Um, I think what I'm going to do, rather than, well, let me, I'm going to do one more thing. I got an, I got an email. This will, you guys will have just enough time to do this, I think. Uh, I got an email from one of our former students that's been in, that had been in class. And I want you to talk a little bit about this with your small group. Uh, here's, her, here's her note. She says, hi, Rick. I have a financial dilemma I would like your advice on. I planned on doing a one-year internship with a missions organization in Poland starting in August. This has been my plan since I was 16, to see if it was what I want to do long term. Two days ago, my mother told me I will owe my parents a minimum of $400 a month for the next nine years in order to help pay off my parent plus loans. That's equal to one third of my Poland expenses. I will be living off full support and making no money in Poland, and I do not feel it is right to A, leave, the, leave with a load of debt or B, have supporters to pay off my loans that in the end will be more than half of what I need to serve in Poland. I feel the most biblical thing to do is to stay in the U.S. and pay off my debt as fast as possible, even if that is a decade. Even if I found supporters who would take care of that while I'm, while I'm in Poland, which I don't feel right about, that would not be the fastest way to pay it off, and more interest would accrue. Maybe your faith and money class can talk this over. Talk about it a little bit. What would you do if this were you? The fact is, $400 a month, about a third of her Poland expenses. She's been desiring to go to Poland pretty much all of her life as a missionary, but now this debt is on her. What would you do? You guys, back in the scripture, let's see, James 1, 12 through 15. Here we go. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. I wanted to kind of real quickly kind of draft this out for you. I love this passage. There is a spot where God wants you to be. God wants you to be right here, right? This is, this is the sweet spot. God wants you to live and act and be on the sweet spot, right? But this passage, and that's in verse 15, this passage would say that if God wants us here, we are drawn away, right? We're drawn away, right? From where God wants us to be. Verse 14 talks about that. And what draws us away? Well, lust, our wants, and temptation or conception. The temptations. Right? So God wants us here, but no, we're, we're drawn away from God's sweet spot. And if you read this passage, it talks about kind of a turning point right here, where sin has drawn us away, verse 15, right? And we have a choice to make. Either we choose life, right? Or we choose death. We permanently stay out of the sight. And I guess our challenge in this life is to seek to be there. And, and I think this passage is a great reminder to us to not be drawn away by the things of this world, but to seek to know where God would have us and to seek to be on that spot, okay? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.